Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 7th, 2016, and my guest is the great Michael Munger of Duke University, making his record-extending, I think, 30th appearance on Econ Talk. Mike, welcome back. It is great to be here. I just had my 30th wedding anniversary two days ago, but of course, the 30th appearance on Econ Talk is an even bigger event. Yeah, I was going to say, which is more meaningful to you? I, I think there's no question which one. Yeah, and I then it, I mean, we should interview your wife. I'd like to get her perspective on this as well. That that is so never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Our topic for today is a little unusual. We're going to take a look at a paper that you co-authored with Jeffrey Grinovisky that is forthcoming in the journal Social Philosophy and Policy. And the paper is called Reconstructing Racism, Transforming Racial Hierarchy from Necessary Evil into Positive Good. And we're going to use slavery as our jumping off point, but I'm sure we'll get into general issues of ideology and norms and, uh, of course, emergent order. So let's start with uh, racism. Uh, How would you define racism or how do you want to define it for this conversation? Well, I think generally racism is a combination of bigotry and an institutionally privileged position. So any person can be a bigot. Racism requires that the sense of racial revulsion that you feel is combined with an ability to impose that institutionally. So the, there's you know, sometimes you'll hear a question, can a black person be racist in the United States? And by this definition, not very easily. It's the, the, it's the dominant people who control institutions or who make choices of, about the other people's access Rules that is acting on. Yeah. So uh, the way we define it in this paper was that racism became a substitute justification for slavery. And the reason was the original justification for slavery, which was the Roman one, uh, wasn't good enough. And so Southerners cast about and found basically an alternative, which was the Greek justification for slavery. And let me just say very briefly what those two are. The one justification for slavery, and it was pretty common in Rome, was that if you lost a battle and were captured, then you might either be killed or kept as a slave. And there's a mutually beneficial uh, exchange, if you will, in the sense that you've already lost. So me saying, I tell you what, I won't kill you if you will agree to act as my slave for the rest of your life. And I may free you, I may not, but that's up to me. And you say, well, you know, killed be a slave. I'm going to go with the slave thing. But it meant that some slaves were very excellent. And in Roman society, some slaves occupied very high positions, positions of respect. It's just that they'd made this promise. It was an economic institution. And that was the way that slavery had existed in Africa. If you lost a battle, then you would be captured by the other side. And you, it was, it was almost like indentured servitude. You could work it off. Well, that didn't work in the American South because they wanted to maintain slaves, to be able to identify slaves, and to have a justification that would allow them to enslave the children, which the old Roman justification would never have allowed. You're you're not going to be a slave if you are born to a slave because you didn't lose in battle. You would have been free. So the Southerners needed a different way, and so they were looking for the Aristotelian notion of slavery, which is that slaves are people who are either morally inferior or lack the judgment to make independent choices. They're either like children or like horses. 
That means that you actually have a positive good justification for enslaving them. If I have a thoroughbred horse or a fancy dog, it would be cruel of me to set it loose, to let it run around because it's not capable of taking care of itself. I have obligations to take care of it. My ownership actually gives me obligations. And what's interesting and what this paper is about is how Southerners worked that out between about 1815 and 1835 and started to understand the implications for how they had to change the economic institutions of of slavery to match this new ideology that they were creating. So let's – at this point, I think it's important to add the uh, caveat that you you make in your paper. We're trying to understand in this conversation, and you you and your co-author in the paper, you're trying to understand how a certain set of views came to be uh, believed, which is a form of an ideology, in this case racism – and uh, when you describe something as an explanation, there is a temptation to suggest it was justified or we, now we understand it. Uh, so I think we should say, uh, as you say in the paper, uh, of course, it, it, it doesn't need to be said, but we'll say it anyway. Uh, this is an evil practice of uh, controlling other people's lives that's repugnant and uh, despicable. So I just want to get that, get that in. So the it's it's clearly a theft of property rights. It's not consistent with capitalism. And some the, lots some Marxist scholars were interested in slavery because they said that it would show uh, how corrupt capitalism is. Capitalism was something that was put on top of this evil institution of slavery. But it is disquieting for someone who, like me, is a defender of markets to see how easily market practices were adapted to work pretty well with the buying and selling of human beings. The, what we're interested in, I have a previous paper with Jeff Grinovisky where we, we try to look at the price of slaves over time in the New Orleans slave market. In this paper, what we're looking at is how Southerners managed to persuade themselves. And I think it's important, that word persuade is important. It's understudied. They persuaded they themselves. They actually came to believe that slavery was first a necessary evil and then later a positive good. That not only could they not do without it, but that slaves themselves were better off as slaves than they would have been in Africa. Now, it's easy for us to look at this with hindsight and say, oh, come on. Or, you know, well, they were, they were telling themselves that, but they're evil people. I think that's a mistake. The fact is, and I actually have uh, talked about this some in class, and people are pretty uncomfortable with it, and I am too. Let me, let me just say, I am too. I think that if I were born to a slave-owning wealthy family in the South in 1830, 1835, I would have defended slavery. And that's terrible. But the fact that you're raised in this system where people take it for granted, where it's a kind of convention, and they had these justifications, these elaborately worked out justifications, does make you wonder what 200 years from now people will look back at our society and say, how could they have thought that? Yeah, I want to stick with that for a minute because I – you know, I, I find it amusing in an ironic and painful way when people say, well, I wouldn't have been like that. Well, so many were. Uh, it was the norm. It was the standard way of looking at the world. And uh, there – but I think having said that, I think it's important to make the point that across the ocean in in England – there were moral voices raised against slavery throughout this period. And in the United States, in the South, even among slave owners, there was a deep unease and an understanding that this was not ideal. And I think it's important when you say first versus later, you're talking about over a long period of time. So uh, why don't you explain the wolf by the ears um, argument for necessary evil and then the transition and how that transition took place over over really over a very long period of time and then try to give us an idea of why you think that happened. Well, what's interesting about this, the wolf by the ear, which is uh, from a letter 
uh, from Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was was convinced that slavery was a necessary evil, but also thought it was temporary. In another letter, he said that these young Virginians have taken in liberty as if with their mother's milk, and that they're not going to put up with it. You know, I'm I don't have a choice. What am I going to do? But boy, these these young Virginians they understand that liberty is not consistent with slavery. It'll end soon, but not yet. So the the Wolf by the Ear had two parts. One is economically, they didn't think that their economic system could survive without access to big gangs of labor, first tobacco and then cotton. The way that these things were farmed uh, required big gangs of cheap labor. But if they had said, all right, let's suck it up. Let's have uh, reparations. And the, all the original reparations proposals were not money for slaves, but money for slave owners. It was as if it was a Fifth Amendment taking. So, yes, we'll give up our slaves, but you've got to pay us for them because otherwise it'll bankrupt our whole society. All right, even if we solve that problem, what are we going to do with all these people? Because we cannot have free blacks living among us. They will... Perhaps understandably, some of them will be pretty angry at the way that they've been treated, taken, you know, wrested away from their homeland, kidnapped and forced to work for generations. We can't let them go and keep them here. So we have two problems. One is economic. We can't do without their labor, and it would bankrupt us to, to get rid of them as slaves. The other is social. We can't have them living here among us. They'll kill so, us. They're, they're, right, and just to be blunt about it. They were worried about revenge and a, com- a combination of mixing of races and social connection and yes, uh, probably justified revenge. Well, that's I mean, I love that image, the wolf by the ears, the idea that you're holding this ferocious creature uh, that you can't if you let go of it, it'll it'll, you know, snap you uh, in two. Uh, yeah. So you're forced to kind of hold on, even though it's an unpleasant yeah. Experience. It's just. It's. It's all. There's no. There's no real option. You can't let go. I went, I, I went back and checked, and we we misquoted in the paper, and I apologize for that. It's singular. Oh. It's the wolf by the ear, which is even that's more. Even precarious. Scarier. <laughs> yeah, that's even scarier. But that's that's why it, it matters. I'm not trying to correct you. No, I, I was correcting you was, politely. So I, I apologize. <laughs> that's great. Uh, Jefferson's language is very precise. It is. It's, so if you have one hand on one of the wolf's ears, you're pretty much running around yelling. Yeah, that's that's precarious um, <laughs> beyond precarious. So that's that's the way it started. It was like, well, we, we've inherited this institution. We're stuck with it. It's not attractive. It conflicts with our ideals. And as you point out, many of the Southerners that we're talking about were Christians, saw themselves as morally upright people, yet were stuck with this institution that the way they justified to themselves, they they felt they were stuck and they couldn't do anything about it. And so it was just uh, – it was a lesser of two evils kind of argument at that – in the early days of, of, the, uh, of the country is what you're suggesting. Until somewhere around 1815, and the reason that the timing is important is – England by this time has gotten rid of slavery. It's gotten rid of slaves. It's gotten rid of the slave trade. And that was 1807, 1808. They were completely done by 1810. And that meant that the big increase in the value of slaves, which starts about 1815 and continues through at least 1830, an enormous spike in the value of slaves, the British had gotten rid of slavery before that happened. Whereas the Americans dawdled. They, they, they disallowed the slave trade in the Constitution starting in 1808. But that just meant slaves were more valuable. The cotton gin, the spinning mule, the, the jenny, those things that allowed the industrialization of the production of cotton thread and textiles meant that slaves doubled in price and then doubled again. And the slave's price is the present value of its the, the implicit wages that that person is earning over time. So if I have a which, slave – Which accrue to the owner instead. Yeah. Which accrue to the owner because I just, just as if the person were a horse. So if, if I rent out a horse and the horse is strong and has is good at, at work, it's valuable. Except, and the slaves live for a long time, and you can teach them blacksmithing and carpentry. They're enormously valuable. So the point being that uh, the cost of getting rid of slaves goes up dramatically because they're much more productive. I don't want to give the Brits too much credit. <laughs> what do you mean? It's not clear Britain would have ended slavery in 1830. 
Right. You're saying <clears throat> they moved at a time when it was re- – yeah, but I think that's that's unfair, I think, in the sense that – I don't know this literature. Uh, my suspicion is it was still a very expensive uh, – I'm thinking back to the episode with um, Lee Fuenar where we talked in his blood oil episode that – and in his book that, that the British – Paid a big price. They just said, yeah, we're not going to have it. Uh, yeah. We're just – this is just morally wrong. It's repugnant and uh, we got to stop. And they did. And it, I think it's – you know, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a cliche, but it's an enormous blot on our history in America that that we did not do that even though it was expensive, right? I, I have to push back from public choice perspective. The only place that kept slavery was the one that had very large fields and a shortage of labor. England doesn't have that. Now, yes, it was expensive, but you could also say Massachusetts, New York, the northern states, they got rid of slavery also, but it wasn't profitable there. So, yes, it was costly for Massachusetts to end slavery, but not nearly as costly as it was or would have been for South Carolina and Virginia. I think it's an open question. Now, you're you're right. It's unfair of me to say England would not have gotten rid of it. But the, the cost that the South would have paid, particularly without reparations, was basically suicide. There's no way the South could have done it. I disagree. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to wear my anti economist hat here for a minute, which is not. An easy hat for me to put on, but I, I do like to wear it now and then. It's in the back part of the closet. And I, if I rummage around enough, I can find it. It's battered because, you know, stuff's been piled on top of it, but I'm wearing it right now, which is I think it's extremely uncomfortable uh, to argue. And I'll let you argue it if you want, but I'm extremely uncomfortable arguing that incentives are destiny. So we all understand that incentives matter. As economists, that's my economist hat. I'll put it back on for a sec. We all understand incentives matter, but we also understand they're not destiny. Again, just like many uh, slave owners justified and, and deceived themselves about the nature of slavery, others did not. They rose above it. They put their values ahead of their financial interests, and we do that all the time. Now, we understand that you – know, just to take an example, if you if you find a, a – property and you can steal it without anyone noticing a wallet on the street where no one's around. Obviously, the the more money in the wallet, the harder it is to do the right thing. But that doesn't mean that there will always be uh, people who who will steal the wallet. In fact, there was just a story in the news yesterday of a cab driver returned a wallet that I think had $187,000 in it. It's an unusual wallet. Um, sounds like a social science experiment. But uh, I, I, I can't accept the argument that somehow we can't quote, blame the South, or we understand that they kept stuck with slavery because it was it was really valuable. I didn't mean to say they weren't blameworthy because individual slave owners could have freed their slaves and chose not to. I think it's understandable and many, and why. And some did, right? George Washington did. Tom, Thomas Jefferson did not. Right. Now the, there was a big difference in their debt position, in you know what they they left. But so I, I don't think. But that, I, I don't hang think, on, I'm arguing that's a, that's an unacceptable moral story. That's an acceptable story as an economist looking from the outside to say, well, I can understand why Jefferson didn't do it. He had a lot of debt. He didn't want to pass it on to his children. And, and the, but the alternative answer is, so what? He didn't yeah. live by his principles. He's a failure on that on that dimension. Not every dimension, but on that dimension. No, I think he is a failure precisely for that reason. So I, I blame Jefferson for not acting on what he said were his principles. What I think is interesting is the institutional response to this problem, because one thing that could have happened is that Southerners could have said, you know, this argument really doesn't work. We have to free the slaves, and it doesn't matter how much it costs. What happened instead was that a lot of very smart people, without having a meeting, without coming up with any sort of conspiracy – concocted a different story, which by 1835 was basically universally held. That's what our paper is about. I'm not trying to make a moral judgment whether it's right or not. What I'm saying is that it's interesting in response to these incentives. So let me, let me, let me try a different tack on this. I think you are fundamentally a Smithian, and I'm fundamentally a Humean. The difference oh, fighting words. <laughs> no, the, the, the difference is that David Hume thought that reasons are the slaves of passion, and passions come down to self-interest. We understand self-interest at a very fundamental level, and we're clever people. We can harness our reason in service of those passions and persuade ourselves that what we're doing is actually right. And I was shocked at the the cleverness of the arguments 
that and these remind me of the things that Nazis did for Jews, and you know, with, and I, I would put them pretty much at the same moral level of just execrable. But it, it once you 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 think it. How could someone really have thought that? Once you set yourself the task, like a puzzle, how would we justify slavery? They did an amazingly good job. The real problem with this is I grew up, I was born in 1958. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education was 1954. And that said that uh, segregation is per se unconstitutional. It doesn't matter if they're equal, they can't be separate. I was going to segregated schools still 10 years later. The resistance of Southern elites because of this concocted ideology about racism was so deeply ingrained in the South. Even today, we still are tortured by its legacy. We're still tortured by the legacy of this racist ideology that Southerners created. So I, I don't in any way think it's defensible. I think I may be trying to make the case that it's even worse than I'm, you're saying. I'm just, well, first I want to say, I, you know, I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts, and uh, my high school was integrated because we bust uh, two kids from Roxbury into our Lily White High School one of whom was the best basketball player in the state, just by coincidence, who took us to the state championship. His name was Ron Lee. He um, played for the uh, U.S. Olympic team, won a gold medal, um, and was had a successful career with the Detroit Pistons. What uh, a surprising coincidence. Yeah, just, just hap- I, I, I don't remember who the other uh, person was, but I, I wonder what his skills were. But that was just the way it turned out. Um, so I certainly uh, I can relate to that, but the – the point I'm, what I'm trying to do here is pull you back from the social scientist perspective, and I just think we have to I, – I, I understand the role that incentives play. I understand why a very valuable uh, activity that is morally repugnant gets done anyway by people who think of themselves as good people because they self-deceive. That's, I, that's the Humean in me, and I think the Humean in Smith, actually, because I think he understood that as well. But I, but the point is that I don't. I think we want to be careful in saying, you, "Well, can you blame them?" And I think you can. And I, you can't blame them in the sense that uh, saying I would have been, I wouldn't have done that. But I just think you have to make a judgment, and especially when you know that there were other people who went the other way and who did in other countries. Now to say that England. It was cheaper for British uh, slaveholders to, to do without slavery because of the nature of the economy. I totally agree, and I agree as a social scientist that helps explain and maybe un- help us understand why they uh, got rid of slavery voluntarily without a civil war or without any kind of violence. But I think you have to be careful in how you talk about it. That's all. Uh-huh. Well, it, so, is in- it is interesting that Britain was able to get rid of it. The United States, maybe because it was not a unified system, it was federal, more or less left it up to the states, plus it was built into the Constitution. I really am troubled by the fact that my knee-jerk reaction is to blame the South uh, and then say I would have done something different. I'm interested in the like the, the Stanley Milgram experiments, the obedience to authority experiments where people look – uh, from the outside at experimental subjects who were asked basically to torture a confederate of the experimenters, and they always did it because authority told them that. So the, the, what, what I'm interested in in this paper is not the individual morality, but the authority that comes from having a political consensus and how dangerous that can be. Okay, well, Karen, I, I will add that I, I'm a skeptic about the Milgram experiments, but uh, whether there were reliably done and whether they were – whether they really capture what happened. I'm, and I don't – at the same time, I don't think you need an experiment to understand that people will do heinous things because they think it's acceptable or because authority tells them it's fine or someone says, go ahead, who's wearing a uniform, et cetera. Uh, there's no doubt that, that that's, that's true psychologically. I have, no, I have no problem with that. But let's get back to the I, – I, I've taken you away off course. Let's get back to 1815 to 1835 as this – uh, rationale for slavery emerged in the South that it wasn't just uh, a necessary evil, but rather it was it was good for everybody. It was good for the slaves, good for the slave owners, and probably in some ways best for the slaves. The if you read letters 
and this is something that I found so difficult in a way. And in fact, I would have nightmares. And when I was working on the paper and looking closely at letters, uh, would wake up at night and feel bad about this because I was developing some sense of sympathy for people who objectively, I think, are terrible. They're slave owners. But let me give two examples. One is uh, letters of George Washington. He would constantly complain about expensive about how expensive slaves were. I'm always having to buy him clothes. They're you know they're always wanting food and stuff. And he's a pretty sensible guy. But how could you begrudge the fact that people wanted food and clothing? Yeah. The, 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 it, it cost him so much. He just he was treating it. He was a pretty hard nosed businessman. And to be fair, he did ultimately keep his promise and and free many of his slaves. The the second thing that in letters that you find that I find shocking is 40 years later, 1863, 1864, Yankee armies go, then you can tell where my sympathies lie in that. <laughs> the Northern armies, I should say, forgive me, go through the South. Um, and Slaves would just flock. We would leave the uh, plantations and would flock, follow them. And southern slave owners would write letters to each other. They're so ungrateful. I raised them. All this time, I fed them and clothed them. And, you know, first chance they get, they run off. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's what you think? And th th it is. What what what's disturbing about this is not so much the the central institutional problem, the sort of Marxist problem, or maybe a, a, a Doug North style institutions problem, where you're trying to match institutions to economic property rights. It's not a rational process. There was something deeply emotional, where people convinced themselves that slaves were part of their family. So, what slave owners did was they used a family metaphor. And slaves, there's in the case law, if you look at the uh, um, uh, book by Helen Catterall, it's five volumes, cases, con con cases concerning Negro slavery. And it's all the state Supreme Court tort cases about slavery from all the southern states. And it's just fascinating to read old tort cases. When, when you look at those cases, there's two threads that run through it. One is that slaves are like children and are not really capable of making good choices. Or the other is slaves are like horses and they don't have any moral sensibilities at all. And that's what took over Southern thinking. Once you think that slaves are like children or like horses, then there's other things that you have to rearrange the society in light of that conclusion. So there's all sorts of remarkably irrational things that the South did because they had to accept the logic of slaves can't take care of themselves. That's why we have slaves. And that had, that had mostly happened by 1825, 1828. It was unanimous after 1835. And let me just say briefly, the, the end on this was the uh, postcard incident where the the American Association of Abolitionists uh, sent the, the American Abolition Society (AAS) sent tens of thousands of postcards to the South, advocating abolition. And before, in 1831, the uh, Virginia legislature had held famous debates about whether slavery was okay. It was an open question. It was okay to talk about it. After 1835, the door slammed shut. No more can you question slavery. We all agree that slavery is a positive good. It benefits the slaves. When they, when they used to live in Africa, uh, they were cannibals. They didn't live for very long. They didn't have health care. They come here and... We treat them well. We feed them. We clothe them. We give them houses. They're way better off than they were in Africa. And I realize I'm skipping around a little bit, but one other thing that I want to mention is the work of George Fitzhugh, who I think is the most interesting thinker in all of the South. What George Fitzhugh did, he wrote a book, he wrote several books, The Sociology of the South, but also uh, Cannibals All. It's a proto-Marxist theory. I think that's the most developed theory that anyone had, which is, you've probably heard the saying, um, beat him like a rented mule, or you've heard the claim that no one ever washes a rented car. Well, sure. the, claim of the, the claim of the South was 
there's a moral hazard problem of having wage labor. So these workers in these satanic mills of the North, there's a reserve army of the unemployed. I only have to pay them subsistence. I don't care if they starve because there's three more behind them waiting. But slaves, since I own them, and it's really a Kosian argument, since I own them, I have a much better reason to take care of them because they're still going to be valuable to me five years from now. Whereas if I rent labor, I don't care. That guy can die. I'm just going to pay him just enough to induce him to come work for me. He can. I don't have to provide housing, no health care. Whereas with a slave, if he hurts his leg, I'm going to take care of him. It's a remarkable argument once you get past how repulsive it is that this is uh, a justification for slavery. It's an extraordinary uh, example of self-deception, and and it reminds. It's not absurd. It, the, the the comparison to rental means it's not absurd. So the there's enough of a thread there, where the people who wanted to deceive themselves anyway just latched onto it. I just want to make a uh, an analogy I've mentioned before on this on the program when people uh, argue that uh, the average person is incapable of investing his or her own money and therefore we need to have the government do it because of that and we need that's why we need social security say or some other form of paternalism they always forget the fact that if you live in a paternalistic society your ability to think for yourself does get degraded and it does uh you have no reason to invest if if you have no excess savings the government by taking your, your earnings and investing them – not investing them, but making you a promise later that you'll get money back from the government. Your actual Social Security money goes out the door to pay another – either a Social Security recipient or a other beneficiary of government spending. But the point being is that if you have no excess savings above and beyond what the government has taken in the form of payroll taxes, you have no incentive to learn how to invest. And so certainly you will – you will appear for, to an outsider as an ignoramus, rationally so. And similarly, if you are enslaved, yeah. you, your ability to live on your own uh, is going to be very small because you have no reason to learn how to do that. And so that interacts with, with the view that says that they're inferior to say, yeah, well, I guess you know, they don't know very much. I guess they are inferior. So, right. The, over and over again, you see in letters and, and newspaper stories, just look – Look how dissolute and lazy and shiftless these black people are. In fact, you still find this in the 1930s and the 1960s. Well, they're confusing cause and effect. And you've, you've, your analogy is a good one. If I have no reason or ability to have any effect on my investments, I won't know much about investments. You'll look at me and say, well, you don't know anything about investments. We'll have to do it for you. Yeah. We're obliged to for your own good. Yep. Well, slaves were lazy, and I'm making air quotes, because – they were enslaved. They had no ability to make any money from their work, and they were – basically, these were labor actions. It was as if they were striking. So they were trying to get somewhat better working conditions. They were perfectly rational. A lot of them were extremely bright, extremely motivated. They were good workers. The fact that they didn't work hard was well, – Strangely enough, they didn't get much of the benefit from it, so I guess they were yeah. – <laughs> <laughs> but but then but then white people look at them and say, look how uh, lazy yeah, they, they are. are. They're not they're not uh, hard workers. Yeah. Of course they have to be slaves. Yeah. So I think the I mean this. Let's talk a little bit about the um, emergent nature of this. I mean, there was fascinating. I just want to take a step back and take us back to Adam Smith and the uh, the whole idea of of morality as an emergent order. That you and I did a conversation about the theory of moral sentiments in my book on Smith a while back, and we'll put a link up to that. But the idea that that civilization emerges, that we don't need top-down uh, forces to get people to be honest, to get people to be trustworthy because there's a natural incentive. If you are honest and trustworthy, you'll be respected by the people around you and that that is a uh, break on dishonesty and, and – um, people exploiting other people. And of course, Smith wasn't a fool. He didn't think that that worked perfectly. He didn't think it worked all the time. But he understood that there was a there was a set of feedback loops in our desire to be to be respected by others that encourages us to do the right thing sometimes, at least not to put ourselves first all the time. And we've talked about this many times on the program. I always like to add the point that and we call that emerge that order, that those set of norms that emerge, we call that an emergent order. It's something that's not created, it doesn't it's not designed, it isn't 
top down, it's bottom up, and uh, emerges from the individual choices that, that we make in interacting with each other. And it's a beautiful thing. But I concede, and this bothers some people, but I concede at the same time that there are many emergent orders that are not attractive. Leaving things alone doesn't always lead to great outcomes. It's not perfect. Uh, one obvious example is traffic. Racism is another. Uh, you yeah. can have a racist society where if you want to be thought of as lovely by your neighbors to be respected, you have to be a racist. Otherwise, it's like, what's wrong with you? Don't you understand? And I think what's fabulous about this paper is it's a beautiful example, a tragic example of how an ideology or a norm emerges and can be sustained. It wasn't uh, – it's not – writ on high, it's not legislated, the, these emotional and intellectual arguments, they just emerged because they were productive, that people found that if they held these views, they were happier. And so they did. And that was great for them and really horrible for the people they enslaved because it, it, it persisted for another two generations in, uh, and led to hundreds of thousands of deaths So it, through the Civil War. So it is a an incredible example of how uh, an, an order can emerge that is disgusting, not lovely, not delightful, but makes sense in the, to the people who are living through it. And that's the, the, the difference ultimately, I think, between Hume and Smith was that Smith had some more confidence, not that much more. He was actually pretty careful, but he had some more confidence that there were some objective standards that would help us be able to figure out whether – in some objective sense, these norms that we're imposing on each other and trying to live by ourselves are actually good, whereas Hume thought almost anything could happen. And one of the reasons that game theorists are so interested in Hume, and Ken Binmore has written a series of books where he tries to formalize Hume's insights on this, is what's called in game theory the folk theorem. And the folk theorem says that if you have a long-term process – and where people get benefits from cooperating, almost anything can happen. There are, there are all sorts of different arrangements where if I do it and you do it, we each expect the other one to do, they tend to persist. What's interesting about this is that what Smith overlaid on top of that, and that is that we also like to be seen as the sort of person who obeys the rules because that just intrinsically gets us the respect of other people. And there's, a, there's work now in philosophy by uh, Gerald Gauss at the University of Arizona and some others, but in particular Gauss, where he has tried to bring back the, the kind of Kantian concept of, of uh, public reason. And public reason is a set of things, it's a kind of Rawlsian project, but it's a set of things that we would all agree on if we were suitably removed from our own self-interest. And I'm worried... Veil of, veil of ignorance, kind of. Idea. Absolutely a veil of this. That's, that's the Rawlsian part of it. But it's not exactly Rawlsian because it's – Rawls thought and many Rawlsians think that there's one set of things that we would all agree on. Gauss doesn't think that. There's a number that we might agree on. But there are some – there are some limits of, unlike the folk theorem, unlike the sort of human, almost any convention works, there are some things that we wouldn't do. And so what Gauss and I have been arguing about is whether slavery, in fact, the original reason that I wrote this paper, was whether this was an emergent project in public reason or not, which disproves his claim. Because if this could happen, almost anything horrible could happen. Yeah. And the, I'm, I, he still disagrees. It may just have been of a, a, a particular time in the past. I do think it's interesting that it lasted so long. Well, I want to I want to quote Smith because I think it's important here. I, I'm going to defend him a little bit. Um, I, I don't think there's that much difference between Smith and Hume on this, and you can you can disagree with me. But after I read the quote and then make make a point, which is. Uh, Smith at one point in the Theory of Moral Sentiments uh, talks about the magnum, magnanimity of of savage people when they are tortured, and he basically says that they're very stoic, that they can they can be tormented and tortured physically, and they will not show any sign of it. They'll chit chat about it, and Smith finds this very impressive, and then in particular talking about slavery says. Uh, the following, it's a, it's a complicated quote, but it's so um, eloquent and so beautiful. He says, what he's going to say in this quote is that 
it's it's disgusting that the people of Africa are enslaved by the brutes of Europe uh, and and abused. He says, fortune never exerted more cruelly her empire over mankind than when she subjected those nations of heroes to the refuse of the jails of Europe, to wretches who possess the virtues neither of the countries which they come from nor of those which they go to and whose levity, brutality, and baseness so justify, so justly expose them to the contempt of the vanquished. What he's saying is these were morally despicable people taken from the jails of Europe who, who then become slave traders and vicious uh, kidnappers and, and abusers of, of human beings from Africa. He's saying they do it in a way that, that – the, the people that they're abusing have no respect for them. They they have contempt for them and how horrifying it is that that is the way that the world has turned out in writing in, in the middle of the 18th century. And, you know, Smith then goes on to say, and I, I learned this from uh, Dan Klein, my former colleague at George Mason, the, the power of this passage. Smith then goes on to say, gives the example of infanticide that in ancient Greece uh, – Infanticide was considered acceptable. In fact, made a similar transition uh, in moral public justification to the one you're talking about for slavery. It started off well when you're really hungry and you're really poor and you're near subsistence. You can't you can't sustain a child sometimes anyway. So it's sometimes you have to put them on the hillside, and it's a brutal, horrible thing to do. But you don't have really much of a choice. It's a necessary evil. But then it eventually becomes well, you know, it's probably a good thing. It sometimes it's for the best. And it, it becomes much softened, and he talks about how I think even Aristotle and Plato justify it. And Smith is horrified about this. He thinks it's disgusting, and he, he uses this as, a, as, as an example of how cust, what he calls custom can impose moral decisions on us that are not attractive, that these can emerge even when they're not lovely. And he says – he concedes that this can happen here and there, but he, he rejects the idea – that it can be universal, that this would be a – that these kind of decisions, these morally repugnant decisions, well, we might justify what he calls a particular usage, one corner of our society. He said if it was widespread throughout our society that we could abuse each other and do immoral things, society would just fall apart. So he views it as an aberration that can happen but can't be common. Yep. Right, and – I wonder if – maybe you can say it, it, it won't survive and that it to sort of eat away – its inconsistencies will eat away at its moral core. But there do seem to be quite a few of those criminals that he talks about, that, you know, that Europe empties its jail. It's a very evocative claim. But what's interesting is the South agreed about that too, or at least the United States agreed about that. Slave trade is terrible. So they got rid of that in 1808. The question is, how to, what should we do about the slaves that we already have? And the transformation of that, slave trade is terrible, but somehow it's okay to own slaves, really seems inconsistent. And they did this thoroughgoing going cleansing of their institutions, of anything that contradicted it. So let me give one example, and I, I wonder what Smith would think about this example. One of the things that was interesting about slaves, and the, I, I, a lot of people have made this observation, that slavery is inefficient in the sense that people work less hard as slaves, particularly once you take account of the monitoring and enforcement that's required to induce any effort from them, because nobody's going to work as a slave unless you're, you, you force them to. That's just the, the definition of slavery. So, Suppose I have a I own someone who is a blacksmith, and he'll work as long as I watch him, or I can rent him out and let him earn money and buy his own freedom. Now, I, the slave owner, probably are going to prefer the second of those. The slave is certainly going to prefer that. Suppose his market price as a slave is a thousand. I can set a price to him of fifteen hundred. And he can earn that because he'll work harder, he'll save the money, and he'll give me the $1,500. The question is, what did the South think about that? Because it gives the lie to the claim that blacks are incapable of initiative, planning for the future. Standing for themselves. Uh, 
Yeah. So the, I mean, this guy's really smart, and he manages to save enough money to buy himself and his whole family. So he shows up, and you know, his, the, I, I own the whole family. There's the, his his wife, and they have two children. And I've agreed in the past and signed a piece of paper that says, for three thousand dollars, I'll give all of you your freedom. He shows up with the three thousand, and I say, you know, I was thinking about this. You're my slave. That money that you earned, that's actually mine. That's not yours. You didn't make that. So I'm going to take that money, and now how are you going to buy your freedom? Because that money is actually mine. Well, this happened several times in South Carolina and Georgia. And early on, the courts said, well, you know, you made a promise. So it, it, it doesn't matter that uh, – you owned him. You said he could go out and earn the money. He's going to work harder. It would be repugnant to the very idea of contract. Even though we all understand blacks can't sign contracts, promises have to be kept. 1815, 1818, these um, self-purchase agreements were honored. They were enforced. By 1821, the courts had realized, you know, we can't enforce these because it, it, would, it destroys the logical underpinning of the whole system. And so it meant that those contracts were not allowed. Now, if you're a clever slave, you realize you can't buy your own freedom, but you can say, I tell you what, I'll buy yours and you'll buy mine. Hmm. By 1826, those were outlawed. So all of the efficient responses that would have allowed higher productivity and benefit the masters were outlawed in service of this ideology that required – for, for people to be able to say, I'm a Christian, but I own human beings, that these human beings were not fully moral human beings. So they, they stripped away all of the things that all of us recognize would have benefited both the slave and the slave owner in order to preserve the institution of slavery. I want to raise two points, and uh, if I can remember them and, and, and let you respond. One is – I'm not going to remember both of them, but one of them is if you're right, you'd think there'd be some demand for the slave trade to be reinstated because if you saw the situation of a slave in an American – on an American plantation in, in uh, South Carolina as being superior – to the situation of a, a native African uh, living without slavery, you'd think it'd be a, a charitable act then to go bring some more of them over here. So I think that's an interesting question of whether that became more common. The other point I should do now remember is that you know part of the – I suspect – maybe this is in your paper – part of the resolute rejection of any opening toward freedom and that, that the South felt – was perhaps a result in part, besides these economic factors uh, and the self-rationalization, was also in part a reaction to the North's uh, relentless drumbeat that it was wrong and yeah. that they were um, – so I think there's a digging into the heels. But I would yeah. like to hear what you think of first the point about the slave trade. But second, how did people in the South persist in seeing this as a paternal – a uh, good deed toward the slaves when so many people in the North said others, I guess they said to themselves, they just don't know them like we do. I guess that would be the rationale. Both of those are good questions. The first one I've actually looked for, and I haven't found anything. That doesn't mean that it didn't happen. But it does seem like if you're going to implement this ideological program and become persuaded by it, it's pretty obvious that you would say, well, we should go as missionaries and yeah. bring over more slaves because we're actually benefiting them. Now, the I, I, they may have been worried that it was – too expensive, too difficult. I think that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that one. Well, the, absence no question. Of, the absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, so we don't we don't know. But yeah, but it's still you'd think it, there would have been something, and I did look a little bit. So the it may just be that I'm not looking in the right places, but it's something that you might have thought the newspapers would have at least put up as a trial balloon because they were all trying all sorts of things during the during the 1830s. Well, the the second question that you ask, there's absolutely no doubt that the 1831, two things happened in 1831. One was the Nat Turner Rebellion, 
which just sent shockwaves throughout the South. Herbert Aptheker, who has a, a catalogs Negro slave revolts, he has 220 different Negro slave revolts. If you look through them, almost all of them were labor actions where they were trying to say, instead of working 14 hours, we want to work 12, we want breaks. Uh, and if not, then maybe we'll kill the overseer. These weren't really revolts. Nat Turner was a real revolt. And they tried to, they, the South, tried to suppress information about it. But the, in some counties, they, the, the whites were outnumbered by blacks 10 to 1. And if there was a servile revolution, any attempt to foment servile revolution was treason of the worst sort. And the South saw the North as trying to do this. Also in 1831 was the debates in the Virginia legislature, which seemed to legitimate asking questions about whether slavery even could be justified. So those two things unsettled Southern elites so much that there were newspaper campaigns saying we have to prevent anyone from asking these sorts of questions. Questions. And then the cherry on top was the extremely ill-advised attempt by the American Abolition Society in 1835 to send tens of thousands of postcards and abolition newspapers to through the Postal Service uh, that were then distributed in the slave states. And they had giant bonfires and riots in protest to this. So anyone who might even privately have a sense, you know, maybe the slavery thing isn't so good. Good. If they said it, they would be beaten. They would not be lovely. They, they would be ostracized. So some of them, if you, you freed your slaves, you had to go north because you were contributing to the problem. Free blacks were, uh, they were perceived as being dangerous because they had guns. They would, be the, they would be the conduit for servile revolution to start and be perpetuated. So 1835, that postcard campaign is what, in my mind, ended any legitimacy for a discussion of whether slavery might be ended in the South. Let's look at some other um, related ideologies. And one thing we haven't talked about, there were two white people talking about this, but um, you know, skin color, it, it would have been an interesting case if these had just been uh, white slaves, which of course there are white slaves in history. Uh, the fact that they were a different color of skin, I think made it much easier for people to be uh, judgmental and to hold racist views. And not just easier, it made it possible because yeah. the, the Roman slaves and indentured servants wouldn't have served the purpose. So I just I want to talk generally about how uh, either fear or disdain or hatred of the other, whether it's uh, skin color, religion, uh, sex, this is a a pervasive phenomenon in history. Um is it serving similar purposes historically uh, to the ones you're attributing to to racism in in the South in the eight, 19th, early 19th century? I think the answer to this is rather long, and it's a bit speculative, but it's something that really interests me. Our minds are evolved to live in clans whose size is governed by Dunbar's number, so something like 150. And that's the number of people we can actually have individual relations with that we know that we know we can trust. Some of the some um, anthropologists have speculated one of the reasons that the that humans have such sharp vision and big brains is that we can detect dissembling. We're looking to try to figure out whether someone is lying. So we have cultural shibboleths that allow us to say we're part of the same group. Now it's true that race is something that's socially constructed, but having Something as obvious as skin color as a way is a, is a reduces the cost of me having these views. So we are not we're not constructed psychologically to live in big groups and be able to trust uh, other people automatically. One of the reasons that markets are so important is they reduce the transactions cost of trusting. So as as as, Mar as uh, Smith said, you know the extent of the market is what limits division of labor. Extent of the market means we have to evolve other institutions, though. It's not something that just gets bigger. We have to have ways of having distributed trust. And th those are really expensive. Those are really hard to do. Race is a very convenient one. And as long as you're on the winning side and you can construct, that's why racism is so important and so different from bigotry. We've come full circle. Racism is a set of institutions that allow me to use some feature, real or imagined, 
it may be entirely socially constructed. So Dr. Seuss has this thing about the, the Zaxes, I think. Some of them have stars on Dars and some don't. They're identical, but some have stars on their chest. And it's a, it's a story of, of racism. And then it turns out that uh, the, uh, several of them have stars and it was unexpected. It, they, they didn't have the features that they thought. People became confused. They were no longer sure that it meant what they thought it did. It's easy for us to fall into, because of the way our brains are constructed, this, this uh, us versus them. We're, Smith talks about how psychologically uh, you know, we, we, we cooperate, we want to be lovely. There's a dark side to that, and that is we want to be lovely to the people that we care about. And if basically we, des- we de- deny social standing, and that's what that's what racism is about is deny social standing. You don't count. You don't count in the society. If, if you don't like me, it's OK. I don't care whether I'm lovely to you or not. So I guess, the you know, the, the standard view is that uh, in authoritarian states run by dictators and occasionally uh, by democratically elected demagogues who often head toward dictatorship, uh, they use fear of the other. Uh, and disdain for the other as a way to unify the population. This is more of a top-down <laughs> um, formulation of, of racism or, or sure, ideology. They're, they're taking advantage of this residual brain architecture that comes from the fact that we grew up in small places. So it can be exploited. Napoleon said, my great military genius is that I can make men die for little pieces of ribbon. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, and I guess – we have gone culturally in America, at least I, I used to think so. I'm not so confident now, but I've, I felt that over the last 25, 30 years, at least in many dimensions, we have gone to a, a very, very different uh, ideological norm of egalitarianism, that, of tolerance and openness toward basically everything, uh, much less judgmental uh, about a whole variety of of either endowments that we have, such as skin color or choices that we make in terms of lifestyle. Um, and the prejudices may still persist because of the, that brain architecture you're talking about. But culturally, it's it, in, in many circles, not all, and we're seeing a backlash against it right now. In many circles, it's just considered uh, totally inappropriate. Yeah. And I think it's to judge people by any of these factors. And I think it's just an extraordinary um, time in human history to to wonder whether that is just a, a veneer or whether that is sustainable. And, um, you know, I think for a lot of people, a lot of postmoderns, um, you know, we're entering a new world where we're all equal, no one's judged, and uh, we're all going to sit around the campfire and, and sing uh, folk songs. But there's a darker side of us that uh, remains and I think um, can be exploited and, and civilization may not be quite as resilient as we sometimes think it is. Well, and paradoxically, the reaction of many people who believe that to someone who doesn't believe it is to ostracize and exclude them and to accuse them of being terrible people. So they, there is still an outgroup, and that yes. is someone <laughs> who doesn't immediately agree with every single part of that program. So it, it is interesting that we have managed to get rid of much of what was – sort of accepted the differences between women and men, differences between races, uh, differences between sexual orientation. Uh, it's no longer acceptable to discriminate on those bases in many sorts of societies. But anyone who is seen to do that is immediately ostracized. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that we're that good at discriminating. The problem is that when I see someone violate what I think are the norms, my body is suffused with a cocktail of chemicals. I emotionally provide the norm of uh, enforcement of the rules. And even if the rules are different, I still have that emotional response. We're no longer using reason, and the reason is is still a slave of the passions. I'm I'm going to make a kind of Humean point here. Yeah, yeah, I extend that. I think because I think uh, I, I'm certainly in agreement with that. And as I said, I think Smith, in many ways, was also. I think Smith recognized that. 
that we self-deceive, but I think it is uh, it is a fascinating thing that we see ourselves as civilized. Uh, we see ourselves as uh, post postmodern. Maybe is not the is not the right word. I don't know what the right word is. Post post heathen, post savage. We're, we're, we see ourselves as a, ironically as as I think a different species than these than the people that we were talking about in eighteen fifteen. Yeah. They they were primitive. Yeah. They had these. Yeah. These views, and I think it's 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 an unanswerable question, but there's certainly the possibility that deep down we haven't sh- probably haven't changed at all. Well, in evolutionary which, terms, it's the blink of have, an eye. Yeah, we can't have. No. So, so is culture that powerful in in imposing costs on me? You know, again, coming back to the Smithian, the cultural feedback loops that I think sustain our civilization, sustain our norms. Uh, you know, we. We want the approval of the people around us. A certain set of things become morally acceptable, and so we grab, we grasp onto those, and then they become not acceptable. In which case, we change uh, over time. And so now, in the South uh, or the North, uh, race, overt racism is is considered socially unacceptable. Uh, but are we really any different than we were back then? Right. And if we are, is it just the result of culturally knowing that I'm not allowed to say this? Uh, maybe we still construct in group and out group. We're, we're bound to that. That's just unavoidable. And the, the psychologists who point out that these are socially constructed, I think, underestimate their potency. Nonetheless, the fact they're socially constructed doesn't mean that we don't use them every day to make judgments and saying you shouldn't do that is not as good. And this is why I'm interested in the problem of persuasion. I think the great unanswered question. Uh, un- understudied problem in the social sciences is persuasion. And Doug North, uh, one of my dissertation advisors, always put it this way. Why is it that people never change their mind until they do? Yeah. Because usually they don't, and yet sometimes they do. Yeah. Now, persuasion's not, I got new information. And that's, you know, I, I, I drive a BMW and I hear that a, a Toyota is better. All right. I didn't change my mind. I got new information. I have the same preferences. Persuasion means I actually change something that I believe. And it doesn't happen very often. But did Southern racists change their mind? There are, there are old people now who the, George Wallace ended up being uh, quite popular among African Americans when the, the, after he had been a racist, stood in the schoolhouse door, uh, he ended up saying, you know, I was wrong about all that. So a number of people who had been segregationists said, I don't know what I was thinking. And I don't think it was just instrumental. The, the, the many people have said uh, they're opposed to gay marriage. They get to know a gay person and they say, well, I don't know what I was thinking. So the, the, we are in a period where many people are changing their minds about social constructions that seemed hard. But these institutions are not hard like steel. They're hard like glass. They shatter. They break. And when they break, they're not there anymore. They're completely gone. And so the, I, I think we need to think more about persuasion. It's not an accumulation of information. It's something else that we don't understand very well. And that's one of the things that social scientists and economists should work more on. What, how are we constrained by our moral beliefs? To what extent are our moral beliefs part of our objectives? And that's why I am interested. There's one more point that I had wanted to to bring up that I, I think is related. The, you had mentioned earlier about the uh, Rawlsian veil of ignorance, and there's some debate about who came up with this first. And John Tomasi uh, recently pointed out that Hayek had said something quite like it. I found, I think, the first instance of the use of a veil of ignorance. And notice that the veil of ignorance is a challenge about persuasion. So I say, I believe this. The veil of ignorance says, well, would you believe that if you didn't know what your position in the society would be? Right. 
Slavery is obviously a perfect example, and it was the, the Baron Montesquieu in Spirit of the Laws in 1748, which is a, a very long time ago, who first came up with this. And we'll put up a, a link to the actual uh, passage in Spirit of the Laws. But basically what Montesquieu asked was this. We always hear people talking about how great slavery is. And you say, well, slavery is beneficial to you, and it's beneficial to the slaves, but it's mostly slave owners who say stuff like like that. Which makes you think. <laughs> well, suppo- suppose we all go into a room, and when we come out, some of us are going to be slaves and some won't. Now, do you still believe in slavery? And if that's the standard, then okay. But otherwise, I'm not persuaded that this is really a, a moral argument that we about how we should live our lives. And so what's interesting is there are these conventions And then there are these challenges, and I think Rawls deserves credit for having said, here's a standard that it would have to pass. Jerry Gauss and the people who want to work on public reason deserve credit for saying, here's a standard that it would have to pass. I don't know what we're going to end up believing, but if you think this, then in order for you to persuade anyone else that it's actually just, it would have to pass these sorts of tests. It's not exactly the same thing as understanding persuasion, but it is a way of problematizing the conventions that come down to us that we just accept because they're traditions. No, I think it's a really deep point. I think those of us who um, who like free markets, free trade, we're against government intervention of various kinds. Um, I think we have to use that veil of ignorance. And, you know, when I hear people talk about you know, we need to privatize Social Security because you'd make more money. Uh, well, you'd make more money, the person typically yeah. on the website. But that there are other people who are being subsidized by the current system, and they wouldn't make more money. They'd actually lose a lot of money. Uh, you might argue that's that's just, but please don't pretend that everybody's going to be better off if we get rid of Social Security. We might be, but that that's a very different argument than saying um, if you had your money to invest for yourself, you'd do better than the government's because the government system – which they don't invest, which uses a pay-as-you-go system, um, has a built-in redistributive aspect to it that that uh, helps poor people. And that's uh, my my one of my many complaints about Social Security is that that should be transparent. That, yeah. And my preference would be that we just had a, a, a program that helped all people who are poor, and we could yeah. see what was really happening. But the way it's done now, it's a pretend system that says, you know, you pay into it and you get back, quote, yeah. your money, which is a lie. So, you know, when you make this justification that, Social Security is good because you make more money. I think that's a totally unacceptable social justification. So when you make an argument that we should have private schools, no government schools, you have to make the argument if you are a non-poor person making that argument as as I am, blessed to be, I have to make the argument it's good for poor people. It's not just good for rich people who can avoid the the tax burden of redistribution, et cetera. Uh, You you can justify – at least that's the way I think it ought to be and I think – when we talk about the potential for capitalism to let people flourish, uh, you have to have a, a, an argument for why a market system will let more people flourish or different people flourish or there'll be more flourishing. You can't just say, well, it's good for me because it is good for me, the current system. Yeah. And I think it's uh, – one should always be aware of of, of your own – one's own prejudices in, in, in sustaining that. So I'm really coming horribly full circle here. I'm suggesting – that we have to be careful that we don't act like slave owners and say, well, it's good for everybody. Uh, and, and people on the left uh, who are um, worried about free trade will often say to me and to others like me, well, it's easy for you to say you're, you don't have to compete with foreign professors. But of course we do. And I wish we had to compete more with them. At least I, I say that. And do I really believe it? That would be the, the test of my, of my claim. You might very well – I mean the advantage of the veil of ignorance actually is you're taking yourself out of your self-interest as being a professor and saying what's going to be mostly better for the system. So using the veil of ignorance approach, you're probably more likely to favor competition with foreign professors, whereas I'm clever enough to come up with reasons why – Maybe we shouldn't do that because I know that I'm going to be a professor. Your the, the the general question you're coming dangerously close to a heresy here, and I I I want to ask you don't have to answer I'll I'll answer first, but uh, I'm I'm worried that you're a heretic like I am. Is there such a thing as social justice? Hayek said no. I think yes. 
Explain. Well, there are institutions that we can judge about their performance behind the veil of ignorance, or as Montesquieu talks about slavery, separate from individual acts. And the test is that does it satisfy the test that if I didn't know what my position in the society was, I would say, yes, that's the sort of society that produces a set of outcomes that uh, I think are consistent with justice. Now, it may still be true that there's no way of getting there. It's not obvious how uh, whether a redistribution is just because of the other side problems that it causes. But I don't think that social justice is a nonsense concept. He said it was like a moral, Hayek said it was like a moral stone. But that's one of the reasons that I write for Bleeding Heart Libertarians. I'm, I actually think that our side, whatever that means, should take the problem of social justice a little more seriously. And that's one of the reasons that I'm so interested in these, this, this appalling institution of slavery was that it was constructed by people who themselves were interested in justice and who made a defense – that when you look at its complexity and its the, the logic of its construction is actually pretty hard to attack directly if you grant the premises. Yeah, I don't know how I think about that. I have to I have to chew on that. I don't. Um, I haven't read that Hayek piece in a long time. Uh, I certainly am sympathetic to your argument that that we can we can view certain institutions or certain rules or certain norms as just or not. Uh, and I do think the, the part about this conversation, I think that we've stumbled on, which I love is, is forcing yourself to use the veil of ignorance to, um, if I may mix metaphors here to merge with the impartial spectator, this idea yeah. that yeah. they take, try to take out your own, self-interest, try to take out your own prejudices, uh, your own upbringing, your own set of values you've absorbed in a thousand ways that you think you've come to because of reason, but it's just a lot of it has nothing to do with reason and you have to, one has to concede that. I, I just would say in closing that um, – and I've made this point before, but I think it's an incredibly important point – we live in a very mixed system in the United States right now economically. It's not – there's some free market elements. There's some socialist elements. There's some uh, top down, lots of top down, still many things that are bottom up. And when government messes up, uh, you know, it, it has a cost. But the fact is I have a very good life. And I think it's – you know, when people complain about, say, the president of the United States, whether you're on the left or the right, doesn't matter. Uh, you know, you People complain, you know, the country's going down the tubes. It's horrible. Well, for a lot of people, it's actually quite good. And, and to some extent, I think the pessimism people have is misplaced because we've misinterpreted some of the data. So, you know, for a lot of people, it's really good. And there are a lot of bad things that could happen that would still allow me to have a decent life in terms of my ability to express myself, my ability to use my talent, my ability to dream, my ability to create. Those are things I value deeply. And I think my children are in a position where they'll be able to do that, too, because of the many uh, gifts and advantages that they, that they have over other people. And I'm not worried about them. When I worry about government intervention, I'm worried about the kids who are not getting a good education, who have horrible home neighborhood environments that are violent and dangerous and and disturbing. And I, I think – those are the people we should always be worried about. So that's the sense in which I guess that's the social justice side of me. And I think certainly rhetorically, if not in reality, and I do think it's real, those are the people we should care the most about. I, I think that's a brilliant formulation. It, it's really interesting that most of the time we can probably rely on the impartial spectator. But you might want to ask yourself now and then, does this pass the more abstract test of the veil of ignorance? Because then I'm actually putting myself in the position of people I might not have contact with very much. And mm -hmm. I, if, I, I wish I had said this because I think what you said is exactly right. The reason I was interested in studying slavery in this way is I think many Southern elites managed to persuade 
their impartial spectator that this was okay by avoiding the logic of the veil of ignorance and I worry that we're all capable of doing that. So it's a the, the way that you put it is a, a terrific way of understanding the check that we might have. We should we should usually be confident about the impartial spectator, but sometimes you may want to ask yourself, what if things were different? My guest today has been Michael Munger. Mike, as always, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>